sing a song called Graves into Gardens and you might have heard it before, you might have sang it with us before, but I want us to just really soak in this song because it just talks about true transformation in Christ. And what better way to do that but on a Sunday morning, amen? Amen, let's go ahead and sing this together. Every desire is now 
about what God can do in our lives. It's about transformation. It's been such a discouraging year, hasn't it, church? It feels like everywhere we turn, all we hear is bad news. Everywhere we go, there, people are just asking for more and more and more of us. And sometimes we can wake up and we feel so broken, like our efforts are never good enough, like our efforts are not enough. But in this moment, this song that we're about to proclaim, the truths are about how God is our strength and God is our fortress. We should not seek approval of man, it says in the Bible, but we should seek approval of our God. So in this year that's been so difficult, it may feel like maybe there's no end in the tunnel, like we can't see that light. And maybe for some of us, uh, it means a lost job, or it means a sick child, or a sick parent, or it means going to a job that might feel like all we're doing is, is giving and giving and, and not seeing any of those fruits. Whatever situation you're in, I pray that you would just give everything at the foot of the cross this morning and that you would know in your heart, based on the truth of his word, that he is going to deliver us. And if it's not here in this earth, church, it's in heaven, in eternity. And that pain, church, that pain that we feel, Amen, that's so exhausting and, and it's taking everything out of us. We know that when we get to heaven one day, that he is going to look at us and tell us, good job, faithful servant. I was your strength and you finished the race for me. So let's sing this out with everything we have this morning. When this life is over, I feel like giving up. I will cling to all you've promised. You will always be enough. When the world around me crumbles, and it's hard to understand. shelter. I'm safe within your hands. Who oh, you are my help forever. I will not fear. God, you are with me. I know you're near. You'll never Cross, remind 
reminds my heart to trust your faithfulness and love will always be enough. Come on, lift your voice, sing it out together. Oh, you are a fortress for the weak, the strength. Once again, welcome to Elevate Church. We're so happy that you guys are here. Are you guys happy to be here? Are you guys happy to be here? Amen. Um, man, so, you know, I know we're stripping it back a little bit here uh, in, in the, on the stage, man. But I believe that, man, the way you guys are singing, the way you guys are worshiping God, man, it is full. It is full of life. And I believe that God is accepting our worship. You guys, you believe that? You believe that God is accepting our worship? I know I, 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 know I believe that. Um, so, you know, we all live our personal lives, you know, as these songs are kind of saying, you know, that God can turn any grave into any garden, you know what I'm saying, into a specific garden that will bear fruit and it's due right time. And I believe that God is with us, you know, and that we can trust in him alone. But the reality is that we all go through some times in our lives that are a little difficult. It seems like we're going through some battles, some more, some internally, some externally. Um, and for us, I just want you to understand that God is not afraid and God is not hiding from whatever it is that you're facing in your life. God is able, God is powerful to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, hope, think, or imagine. And I believe that he wants to do something special in our lives. And our position in this battle is to worship him. And this is what this song is talking about. No matter what you feel surrounded with, God is here and he wants to move with power. Do you believe that? Come on, put your hands together. You believe that. Sing with me. There's a table that you prepare for me in the presence of my enemy. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. Come on, sing it again. There's a table. Sing one, boys. There's a table you your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battle. Whoa. I believe. And I believe you overcome and 
going to surrender things to God. We're going to surrender in obedience to our God, to our Lord. Not in an emotional state, but God is pressing something in us, something of truth, something of value. Whatever it is that you're going through right now in this moment, church, just surrender to God. No matter how you feel, how you're surrounded, understand that it is he who holds you in this moment. It is he who sustains you. It is his truth. It is his way that are best for your life, that will liberate you. So God, here we are with our hands raised, surrendering everything to you, Lord Jesus. There is nothing, nothing is better than you, God. Absolutely nothing is better than your word, than your truth, than us living in the center of your will. So God, here we are. We trust you. You alone are our refuge. You alone are our strength. You alone are our hope. You alone are our peace. You alone are our joy, God. So here we are, Lord Jesus, hand raised in surrender and adoration, reaching out to you for you are our only truth, for you are our only hope, God. And I just pray right now that in this moment, as we dive into your word, that we may not just have our hands surrendered, but we may also have our minds, our hearts, our obedience, our steps, Surrender to you. So God, have your way in this place. Surround us. Fight the battles for us. You alone get the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say with a mighty shout, amen. Come on, church, put your hands together. Well, welcome, church, to Elevate. How are you guys feeling? You guys feeling good? Come on. There we go. All right, so let's take the next couple moments. Say hello to one another from afar. Maybe blow each other a kiss, air hugs, air high fives, anything. Make sure they feel welcome. All right, and take a seat and prepare yourself for the word of God. Come on, church. Elevate Church. How's everybody doing today? Man, it's great to see you guys here, man. Great to see all of the families here at Elevate Church. There's no better place that we would rather be, man. We want to welcome all of our first-time guests. If you are our guest this morning, we want to welcome you in a very special way. Elevate Church, on the count of three, let's throw down a welcome for our guests. One, two, three, come on. Yes. Welcome. All of our guests that are here, man, we are elated to see you guys, man, so many families. Today is a special Sunday. Today is Baptism Sunday. God is still moving in our church. God is still changing lives. And today we celebrate many lives who have given their life to Jesus Christ. So, man, let's, let's celebrate these individuals. If you're being baptized here today, we want to celebrate you. So, church, let's celebrate them and let's celebrate new life in Christ. Congratulations to all of you who are getting baptized today, man. That's such a special uh, Sunday. Man, I want to welcome all of the first-time guests, family members, friends that are here. We've had guests all morning long here at Elevate Church. We want to welcome you, and we want to know who you are. We want to welcome you in a very special way. So we invite you to do one thing, right? So uh, to do one thing that will allow us to welcome you in a personal way. If you take out your phones real quick, send us a text message. Send a text message to number 94,000 and send the word 
go elevate all right send the word go elevate and we're going to respond to that text with a link click on that link and fill out the, the virtual connection card and that's going to give us an opportunity to welcome you in a uh, personal way and also it's going to keep you in the loop of all things elevate church so once again welcome all of you who are here live those who are online those who are in the overflow uh we welcome you guys a special sunday that god has prepared for us uh so many new things uh just coming up at us for the rest of the year and we're excited at this moment let's look to god in prayer and let's ask the lord to speak to our hearts remember this is the time that we have allocated for the lord to move in our lives for us to worship him right to surrender stuff like jerry was saying before our god and for him to speak into our life so let us pray and let's ask god to own this moment father we thank Thank you, God, for who you are and what you've done. God, we're here in obedience to lift up your name, Father, to praise you, God. We're here to hear from you, God. So, God, we, pray, we, we ask you, God, to speak to our lives. Speak to us and through us, God. Speak into those areas in our life where there needs to be transformation, God. Father, subtract the things from our life that need to be subtracted. Father, add the things to our life that need to be added, Father. Have your way with our lives, with our will, with our choices, with our thoughts, with our families, God. Father, you are our God. We serve you, God. We surrender to you. Have your way. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, churches. Give it up for our God. Today we're continuing on our current series titled Christian Atheists. Christian Atheists. How many of you enjoyed last week, man? God spoke to you guys in a, in a special way, right? Through that word, Christian Atheists, right? Um, now, what does that mean, Christian Atheists? Can those two words go together in the same sentence, right? So I'm just going to go and do a little review of what the, the, the terms mean and see if they can be, uh, uh, see if you guys can capture the vision of what we're doing. Let's look at the first word, Christian. The word Christian can be translated as a person who believes in Jesus Christ. So the, someone who is a Christian uh, can be uh, a, 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 a defined as a person who believes in Jesus Christ. Now, what is an atheist? An atheist is a person who lives as if God does not exist. We can say that an atheist is a person who lives their life as if God does not exist. Now, when you put them together, uh, this is the word that you get. You get Christian atheist, and you put the definitions together. You get this, a person who believes in Christ, but lives a life as if God does not exist. They believe in Jesus. They say they believe. They profess in Christ. They could have been raised in church. They could have raised up their hand. They could have repeat after me, after Pastor Lewis, all they want. They can claim that they're Christians, but they live their life outwardly as if there is no God, as if there is no Bible, as if there is no authority in heaven over our lives and over um, um, our decisions and actions. Christian atheists is what we've been talking about. Last week, we talked about that there are people who call themselves Christians, but do not know him. The vision verse for this series is Titus chapter 1, verse 16, and I'm just going to read the first part of this verse. It says that such people claim that they what? That they know God, but they what? They deny him by the way they live. Today, we're going to look at a different angle of this uh, topic. And uh, so here's a statement. There are people who call themselves Christians, but do not fear God. There are people who call themselves Christians, but they do not fear God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, talks about how this will take place in the last days. The Bible talks about the last days. Sometimes we read and hear about the last days and we think, oh, that's in the future when everything is like, 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 like uh, you know, like Star Trek or whatever, when there's flying cars. The Bible called Jesus' days the last days. The disciples called their days. That was 2,000 years ago. They called that the last days. We are in the last days. Since Christ came, died, and resurrected, biblically speaking, we are in the last days. The Bible says that in the last days, people will not fear God. And this is how it describes them. It says this, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. Anybody agree that that describes our days right now, right? I, I see 2020 somewhere in the text, right? <laughs> 
The last days will be very difficult times. Uh, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God. They'll be disobedient to their parents. I see already parents nudging their kids, right? He's like, told you so. It's in the Bible, you know? <laughs> Somebody va a mi caliente today, right? <laughs> That's what my parents used to say. Va a mi calientico, right? <laughs> all right. In, in Spanish, that means you're going to go to sleep after a whooping, right? That's all it means. <laughs> so they're going to be, you know, disobedient to the parents. It says that they're going to be ungrateful, that they will consider nothing sacred. Nothing is sacred anymore, right? It goes on in verse 3. It says, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others, meaning telling lies behind people's back and de defaming their, call, their character. They will slander others. They will have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They will be reckless. They will be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than... And God. Christian atheists. If you know one and they're here, point at them. I'm just kidding, just kidding. No point at nobody, right? Just kidding. And I was like, that's you, I know it, right? <laughs> just kidding, right? Man, such a powerful text, right? That reveals the heart of man and how it's going to deteriorate. Some of you are saying, no wonder the days that we're living in are the days that we're living in. No wonder things are the way they are. No wonder people can just, you know, live their life defaming the name of God and they are careless about it because they do not fear God in the last days. Now, how many of you are um, fans of Chipotle? How many of you love Chipotle? I love Chipotle, right? Uh, I, if I've, this week, I went several times to Chipotle. I saw like 30 people from church there. That's like the, we should do a life group there for lunch, right? <laughs> I mean, we're there anyways. You might as well, right? <laughs> but, you know, we're, in, in Chipotle, you can customize everything. We're living in a day and age where you can customize everything. You get everything how you want. When I was a kid, it was BK, have it your way at Burger King now, right? Like, you can have it your way. However it is you want your bowl, you get it at Chipotle. You go there, and they have lettuce, and they have white rice. They have brown rice. Now they have cilantro, lemon, uh, cauliflower rice, which is a good option, by the way. Um, then they have chicken. They have pork. And then they have that uh, cottage cheese looking tofu, whatever that is, right? <laughs> and then they have, you know, the meats and, and you're like, what do you want? And you're like, I don't know. What, what do you want? And I'm like, I don't know. And the person's like, help me help you. What do you want? I want to feed you. You're hungry. Look at the line. <laughs> and so many options. And you're like, okay, I'll have this, this, and that. Oh, do you want some? Yes. And you get exactly what you want. And at the end, you pay. And then afterwards, you go to Chipotle. Huh? And then after Chipotle, you go to Menchie's. How many of you have been to Menchie's? Menchie's is amazing, right? I mean, choices. Come on. My kids have concocted desserts that no person should ever put in their mouths at all. <laughs> I don't know how sour candy goes. With, I don't know what they do. But you have it your way. How about those customized uh, new Coke machines with little dots and touch screens? And man, how many flavors? I Googled it. You can do 125 different combinations of flavors on those things. I mean, in heaven, we're going to have those soda machines minus the carbs and minus the saccharin, right? It's going to be healthy soda, right? But man, how, everything is customizable today. Even dates, you know, at match.com, you can get a date however it is that you want. <laughs> Some of you ladies be like, I want a guy who loves country music. And, uh, you know, and he's got to be, you know, uh, he, he's got to like cooking. He's got to watch HGTV. He's got to be six foot tall, blonde. He's got to have muscles. He's got to be in seminary because he needs to love the Lord, right? And he needs to be this. Uh, and I want him by Friday. You can customize whatever you want in today's day, right? And that has leaked into the church. We want to customize our own God. It's, it's a, a, a Christianity now that's customizable. Have it your way. We pick and choose what we like from the Bible, and we leave out the things that we don't like in the Bible, right? And we create our own lovey-dovey God. 
that's going to love me and accept me the way that I am. It doesn't matter. I was born this way or I was this way or I, I like to live this way. I'm going to have it my way. I'm going to create my own God. We pick and choose. You know, we want his love, but we don't want his wrath. We want his mercy, but we don't want his judgment. We want his blessing, but I don't want his discipline. You know, we want the things that we like in the Bible and at the end of the day, instead of God creating man in his image, man is creating a God in the image that man chooses. And in the Bible, the moment you create your own God, the moment that you customize your own God to be lovey-dovey and accepting of who you are, you have created an idol. And could it be that a Christian atheist comes to church and raises up his hand and is worshiping an idol instead of the biblical God described in the Bible? We create a mental, ideological image of a false God when we pick and choose what we want. And then we worship that God. You're so loving. You're so accepting of me. You see, how we view God is complex. He reveals himself in scripture. Now, sometimes people pick and choose. I believe in back in the day, we had past legalism and people overemphasize the wrath of God and preachers be like, you're going to hell and you're going to have, you know, you're going to go where the worm don't, don't live, you know, don't die and, and you're going to be there in hell, fire and brimstone and it was hardcore preaching. And sometimes it was a little too much, right? But then I think that on, on the polar opposite of that, in today's day, now you have the licensed preachers. Oh, God is loving. He loves you. He forgives you. You can have it however you want. He accepts you. Everyone goes to heaven. Be careful. Even in Christianity, there's a doctrine called universalism. And they'll tell you, oh, there is no hell. That's a lie from hell. From the hell that they claim doesn't exist. Universalism says that God at the end is so loving that everybody goes to heaven, even Satan gets saved and goes to heaven. That is not the God of the Bible. That is a customized, have it your way, soda machine God that they have created. And every person who worships that God on a Sunday is worshiping a golden calf in the presence of the true God. See, the grace of God alone is beautiful, but it's incomplete. The wrath of God or the justice of God alone is true, but is incomplete. It is both. God is loving. He is compassionate, but he is also holy and just. God is both loving and holy. Do you know that God? Last week we talked about there are people who call themselves Christians who don't know God. Point number one that I want to bring you guys today is this. If you truly know God, if you truly know the God of the Bible, you will fear him. Point number one, if you know God, you will fear him. Now, what does it mean to fear God? Some people sometimes struggle with this, right? Sometimes people struggle. What does it mean to fear God? Well, here's a slide that I believe will help you. The very next slide says that to fear God means that you love him as your savior. Thank you, God, for forgiving me and dying on the cross, I love you as my Savior, but I also respect, revere, and honor him as the Lord. I love him as my Savior. I respect and honor and revere him as Lord. That's what it means to fear God. Kind of like how we love and respect and honor and fear our parents. You know we honor our parents? And listen, I, I, I legit fear my mom. <laughs> she, she still has that, you know? She, remember that movie where you can bend the bullet and it goes like that? A chancleta. She's better than Captain America with that stuff. Remember, I was 19 years old and she still, and she, oh, I'm so sorry you're an adult now. I was like, mom, spit the blood. I was like, I deserved it. <laughs> and we were laughing about it. Just like we love and revere and honor our parents. We must do so to God. God is big. God is powerful. God is almighty. Human beings cannot handle 
His presence. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bible says no man can see the face of God and live. His presence can be terrifying. God can be terrifying, but at the same time, he doesn't want us to be afraid of him. How can I illustrate that? Well, uh, there was a good story uh, of, a, of, a, of a dog, right? There was, a, there was a, a dog. It was a big, ferocious dog. And listen, dogs can be ferocious, right? Dogs can be intimidating. They can be terrifying. A big, nasty-looking dog, right? There was one that kind of got loose, and he had some friends over, and there was a little boy there, and the dog was going straight at the boy. And the boy didn't know this dog, and the boy was terrified. He was like turned white. He's like, oh my. And the boy started to hint like if he was going to run away. And the dog's owner says, son, I'm going to name the dog Rambo, right? If you never had a dog named Rambo, then it wasn't a big mean dog, right? He comes out, son, Rambo, my dog, he doesn't like it when people run away from him. Don't run away. And if you've ever had a dog, you know that if you run away, that's when they chase you, and that's when they presents problems. But if you, you know, draw near to it, you stay still, it comes near you, and it smells you, and it becomes acquainted with you. He says, I, it does, you know, my dog doesn't like it when people run from it. What a picture of God. God can be terrifying. But the worst thing you can do is run from him. A dog, right, a ferocious dog can be terrifying, but the worst thing you can do is to run away from a dog. But if, if you get close to the dog and you acclimate yourself with the dog and, and the dog becomes acclimated with you, a dog can become man's best friend part of the family. It protects you. It guides you. God can, God can be a terrifying thing. Like the, the image of God and, and, and to stand before his presence can be terrifying. But if you draw near to him and he draws near to you in a relationship, he becomes your best friend, your protector, your healer, your savior, your God. When a dog is part of a family, that dog is like part of the family. Like you sleep with the dog, you chill with the dog. He's all over the babies. He licks the baby's face. He's part of the family. He's loving. But if somebody, an intruder walks in, that dog is going after him. Same thing with God. Those who are part of God's family, in relationship with God, we have an amazing loving relationship with our father. We call him father, Abba, daddy. But intruders, those on the outside, should fear God. God is loving and God is holy. Let me give you guys a picture in the Bible of God's holiness. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Isaiah was a prophet um, who was in Jerusalem, right? And he was um, going ahead and he was prophesying on behalf of God, speaking on behalf of God. And, and he has a vision of the throne room in heaven. He has a vision of the Lord sitting on his throne. It says here, it was a ver a verse one, it says, it was the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He had a vision where he saw the Lord. And it says that he was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him, attending him around the throne were mighty seraphim. That's a, a, a type of angel in heaven, right? There were mighty seraphim. Each had six wings, okay? Six wings on each of these angels. Two of the wings were covering their faces. The presence of the holiness of God was even too much to, to bear for sinless, holy angels. Imagine sinful mankind. They were in the presence of God. They live in the presence of God. Yet they cannot stand the presence of God because he is so holy that with their wings they were covering their faces. And it goes on here and says that two wings covered their faces. Two of them covered their feet hiding themselves before God. And with the other two, they flew. And they were calling out to each other, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. What kind of title for a lovey-dovey is God? Is that the Lord of heaven's armies? This is how I fight my battles. 
Because the Lord of heaven's armies got our back. You see, it's not such a terrifying thing when you know him. He's got your back. And it says, holy, holy is the Lord God of, or Lord of heaven's armies. It says, the whole earth is filled with his glories. Their voices shook the temple at, to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Now, I want you guys to think of this awesome moment. Isaiah gets a glimpse of heaven. He sees his Lord sitting on his throne. These angels, these mighty seraphims, what are they saying? Are they saying, good, good, good is the Lord God Almighty? I mean, out of all the characteristics that they could have presented and declared before God, they could have said, good, good, good. Or loving, loving, loving is the Lord God Almighty. Or cool, cool, cool. Or hip, hip, hip is the Lord God Almighty. They could have said like awesome, awesome, awesome is the Lord God Almighty. But what did they declare? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. It's the same vision John in the New Testament, thousands of years later, gets a similar vision. John, in Revelation chapter 4, you read it later on. Same thing, angels in the throne of God saying, holy, holy, holy. Thousands of years later, from, from Genesis to Revelation, Old Testament to New Testament, God is holy, holy, holy to the third power. In Hebrew literature, to repeat something is to create emphasis. He's not just holy, he's holy, 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 threefold. The word holy means to be separate, set apart, transcending from cre creation. God's holiness is what separates him from all other creatures. Sinless perfection, total purity. He transcends all creation by far in his holiness. And his holiness is the basis by which he will judge our sinfulness. That's why sin is a big deal. That's why Christ had to die for our sins. Because God is holy, holy, holy. So when Isaiah stood in the presence of this holy, holy, holy God, what was his first response? Verse 5. Then I said, it's over. I'm doomed. For I am a what? A sinful man. You see, the holiness of God right away shed light on the sinfulness of Isaiah. Man, if you come here and worship God and raise up your hands and you are standing in the presence of God, if God is not highlighting, if the Holy Spirit is not highlighting your sin, then man, I would question, man, do you understand that we are standing in the presence of a holy God? Our sins should come to mind while we stand in his presence. We should be repenting. Sometimes when you see me, if I'm not singing, I might be praying and I am repenting. Because no one's perfect here. God is holy, holy, holy. He says, it's over, I'm doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. Who knows what it was? Maybe he cursed like a, like, like a soldier. I'm so, sorry, like a, what is, like, a, like a sailor. I was going to say a pirate. You're my cousin. You should have helped me out there, bro. That's it. I'm not paying for Chipotle anymore, bro. That's it. <laughs> like a sailor. Maybe, maybe, he, maybe he was a gossiper. Maybe he was a slander. Maybe he spoke, liked to speak about people behind their back. But God shed light on his sin. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. He was standing in the presence of a total, pure, righteous, perfect, just, holy God. He couldn't bear the fact that he was standing in sin. The moment Isaiah became aware of, his, of God's great holiness, he also became aware of his sin and was filled with fear. The more we know God, the more we become aware of his great holiness. And the more we walk and become aware of God's holiness, the more we walk in the fear of the Lord. If you know God, 
you will fear God. If you knew the God of the Bible, you would fear God. We would fear God. But if you're following your own Build-A-God instead of a -a Build-A-Bear, if you're following your own Build-A-God, customized, loving, and accepting everything, God, then we will carry on with our sin without a care in the world. That's how you walk without fearing God. You create your own God who's loving, accepting, and, 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 and maybe, the, again, maybe the church in general hasn't done a good job in showing you who God of the Bible is by preaching. Maybe part of it is on, on the church. But man, open up the word of God. He's amazing, he's loving, and he's holy. Point number two. Point number one, if you know God, you will fear God. Point number two, if you fear God, you will obey him. If you fear God, you will obey him. If you truly fear him, we obey him. There are, you know, some who call themselves Christians, yet they do not fear God. By their disobedience, they're proving to not fear God. Now, how does this happen? A psalm points us in this direction, right? Psalms chapter 36, verse 1 and 2 says that sin whispers. Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. And they have what? No fear of God at all. Now, what is sin whispering at our hearts? In their, it says, in their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. Here, the psalmist is writing that sin whispers in our ears. It's not that bad. If it makes you happy. I always throw that song. <laughs> Can't be a bad. Right? I owe Cheryl Crow some whatever. Some money. I don't know. Whatever. Sin whispers in the ears. Go for it. God accepts you the way you are. Enjoy. <laughs> like Hector said in Spanish, Aprovecha. <laughs> Ale. Do it. Don't let anybody judge you. God don't judge you. Go for it. That's what sin is whispering in our ears. Have you ever had that little in cartoons where you have the little devil here and the little angel here and the angel saying, don't do it, man. God is watching. You remember what the word was? Hey, remember what your life group leader or remember what we learned in church? Ah, do it, bro. Don't listen. That guy's a hater. You know, you're so old spy fashion, man. Come on. Get with the times. The Bible's outdated. Do it. Sometimes they portray that little voice as the devil, right? I want to tell you that the devil is not omnipresent. He can't be with all of us at the same time. He's not God. And he's got bigger fish to fry sometimes. I doubt that the devil's right here on my shoulder telling me stuff. Sometimes we don't give our sinful nature enough credit. We don't need Satan to tell us, do it. Our flesh could do that on its own. We were born in our flesh. We are capable of sinning. In fact, our flesh wants to sin and enjoys and gravitates towards it. Our sinful nature whispers to us and we listen. And it convinces us to have no fear of God at all. And as we listen to our flesh, it changes our perspective. And now we become blind where we no longer see our error. We make at some point a decision in our mind. This is okay. God accepts me. The world is wrong. The Bible's wrong. God is good. I feel okay when I do this. So I'm going to continue doing it. It convinces us where we no longer see how sinful we are. I have a couple of questions to ask the church. Do you have the fear of God to hold you back from sin? When you're tempted, are there red flags? Is there a voice saying, watch out, don't do it, hold back? Or do you just go for it? Oh, later on, I'll, I'll for, God will forgive me later on. I'll turn on... Uh, you know, the Christian radio, and I'll be good. Another question, could it be that we're blind to our own self-centeredness? Could, could we be blind to our own sin? You know, what if, what if we can't see how far? What if, what if you can't see how far you've grown from God? What if you call yourself a Christian, but you don't truly fear God? If you don't fear him, then biblically speaking, can we ask, do we really know him? The greatest evidence 
that you fear God is obedience. The greatest evidence that you fear God is obedience. Watch your life and see, man, am I obeying God? A great example is Abraham. God asked Abraham to do the unthinkable. Abraham wanted a son so bad, prayed for it for years with his wife, kind of took matters in his own hand, grew impatient, but God finally blessed him with his son, his only son, the Bible says, the one whom he loved. The Bible puts so much emphasis on Isaac, the son of Abraham. And God asked him to take his son, his only son, the son whom he loved, and to take him on a mount and to sacrifice his son before the Lord. That's, that's pretty crazy. That doesn't fit the narrative today, right? With the, the, it, was, it was a test. So Abraham had radical obedience. Everybody say that, radical obedience. Radical obedience. That's what he had. He's like, okay, Lord, with a heavy heart, Ab- <laughs> Isaac, let's go. Where are we going? You'll see. We're going to present a sacrifice, and then we will return. They go up the mountain. Sets up his boy. This is crazy. I mean, we're parents. A lot of us are parents here. We're all definitely children of somebody, right? (laughs) He takes a knife and he lifts it before his son. And the moment that he was going to go down with the knife, an angel said, stop. Don't do it. Genesis 22, 12. The angel, stop. God doesn't want you to sacrifice your son. He says, Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that what? That you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son, the one that you loved. It was a test so that Abraham could know that he feared the Lord. Radical obedience demonstrated that he feared God. The greatest evidence that you fear God is obedience. His obedience proved it. Man, so let me ask you a question. Do you truly fear God? Do you obey God? Some might say, I'm a Christian, but I live with my boyfriend. And we live together and we do married people things. But I'm a Christian. I go to church and I worship. And oh, man. We go on trips. We do married people stuff. I'm a Christian, but I watch porn. I'm a Christian, but I curse like a sailor. <laughs> and I said it again, right? <laughs> sailor. <laughs> Ephesians 4.29. Don't use foul language. Let the Lord speak that into your heart. I put it on my social media post. I've heard so many people, God doesn't care. So I dare you to stand in his throne room and tell him and talk like that. If you can't speak like that before the throne room of God, then you shouldn't be speaking that. It's just something personal that I've... I'm trying to lead people. I'm a Christian, but weekends are mine. I don't have to attend church. I got this. I'm a Christian, but it's my money. Give a tithe. That's mine. I'm a Christian, but I can also enjoy the things in the world. I'm a Christian, but fill in the blank. You can't say you know God and fear God if you don't obey God. We cannot live however we want and come to church and, and love on the Lord and sing some songs and hear a preaching and think that we're right with God. That's not truly following Christ. says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, carry his cross daily and follow me. Fearing God means that we love him as our Savior, but we also respect and fear and obey him as our Lord. If you truly know God, you will fear him. If you truly fear him, you will will be obedient to him. Which leads me to the last point. The fear of God will change you forever. The fear of God will change you forever. I remember when I was a kid, and, and a parenting is a great illustration for this. I was in church. I was a little kid. Back then, my parents were in the choir. It was back in the days when the choirs would sit up. My mom and my dad were sitting in the choir. And we behaved. This is the parenting power. I think my parents had the force. Because they had three kids who were sitting alone in church who had to be well-behaved. And she will look at them and she would, Sometimes she'll scoot us over, like me and my brothers, she'll, and I'll scoot over. I'm like, my mom's name is Daisy. Just say Daisy Ridley. So I guess there's a correlation there. I don't know. But anyways, so she's watching online. Yeah, I know, mom. But anyways, 
I'm, I'm going to tell on you a little bit. <laughs> She's watching online right now. Yeah, well, go ahead, mijo. But anyways, so I was in church one day, and my parents were in the choir, and I was, maybe, I don't know, like nine, ten years old, and I, I'm in the middle of church. I, was, I decided to have a nice smoke in church. I got one of the bulletins. Remember the bulletins, right? And I rolled up a fat cigar, and I was like, oh, man, this mess is so good. I was just having my little, you know, coiba, you know, having a big fat cigar. Those bulletins were big. They were like the scrolls of Moses, right? And I'm there, and I'm, while I'm enjoying this cigar, I'm like, I'm like, where's my mom? So weird. Did she get raptured? Did I stay behind, you know? She, she's not in the choir. I'm like, oh, whatever. Puff, puff. <sighs> Amen, preacher. Do your thing. <sighs> All of a sudden, this hand got my ear. <sighs> Whoa! <laughs> All the way to the women's bathroom. Yes, I've been there because that's where moms take their boys to. And boy, she spanked the fear of God in me, boy. <laughs> my mom was a spanker and it worked. So, hey, listen. He who spares the rod, you know, hates the child. But whatever, look it up. <laughs> it's another sermon. <laughs> but anyways, man, she spanked me and she gave me the fear of God. I promise you, after that day, I have never had a smoke of any cigar. I have never tasted alcohol. God is, this is true in my whole life. I don't know what alcohol tastes like. I don't know what cigarettes are. I, she spanked the fear of God in me. And that fear of God changed me forever. <laughs> Man, the fear of God will change you forever. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says in Proverbs 1, 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Solomon said. Man, once you realize and you know who God is, and now that you know who God is, now you fear him. And because of your fear, you're obeying him. Once you start obeying him, you start living a wise life. You start making wise decisions. It brings blessing and benefit. Sometimes we want supernatural, miraculous blessing. Listen, there's blessing just in obedience. Just live according to the Bible and your life will be blessed, right? The Bible says that the fear of God will cause us to hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13 says the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance are the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. There's a perverted speech again. Let the Lord speak to wherever it may. But man, the fear of the Lord is hatred. When you fear the Lord, you begin to hate the things that he hates. You start hating sin and you start hating evil, right? To fear the Lord is to show reverence before God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 through 29, it says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Yes, we live in a kingdom, right? Once we're part of God's church, we are in a kingdom, a kingdom that's unshakable. It cannot be shaken. We're safe once we belong to God. And then here it says, And thus, let us offer to God a acceptable worship. Yes, there's worship that's not acceptable, right? And then, and like Jerry said earlier, hey, you know, I believe God is accepting this worship because there is worship that is not acceptable. Here it says, and let us offer to God acceptable worship. How? With reverence and awe before the awesome holiness of God. Here it talks about when we fear the Lord, we will worship with reverence and awe, knowing who it is that we're worshiping, knowing that we're standing in the presence of the most most high God. We don't worship like the world worships. We don't worship like the world parties. We worship in reverence of a holy and awesome God. To fear and respect God means that we will show reverence in our worship, in our serving, in our teaching, in our preaching, in our study. The fear of the Lord brings life. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 27 says the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The one, you know, that one may turn away from the snares of death. Man, when you fear God, you stay away from things that are, you know, dangerous. It brings health to your life, more longevity when you do things. Let me give you an example, man. When you have a healthy fear of the police, when you're speeding on and you see them, you go, whoa, what happens when you see a cop? What do you do? You take your foot off of the gas and you press on the brake and you start obeying. When you obey the laws of traffic, it is healthier for you. You're not running red lights. You're not driving recklessly. It brings life to one and safety. The fear of the Lord brings life life. The fear of the Lord will change your life 
forever. When you have a true encounter with God, your life will change forever. His love and his holiness together will cause you to serve him wholeheartedly, to give your life to him and serve him forever. Isaiah had a vision before the throne room of God. He sees the holiness of God and that shed light and made him hyper aware of his sin. When he became hyper aware of his sin. He said, I am finished. I'm done. It's like a repentance moment. I'm done with this. How dare I sin? Now he's repenting before the Lord. And the Bible says that an angel stooped down and put a burning coal of fire on his lips to purify as if to burn the sin away, to bring forgiveness and to, because of his repentance and to restore him into a right relationship with God. And then the angel went up and purified his lips and he is forgiven and changed forever. Then God says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord. Send me. A sinful man of impure lips. Sinners stand in the holiness of God because he acknowledged his sin and repented. The Lord did away. He descended, right? The angel descended, took his sin away. And now he gave the rest of his life to the ministry of God of our God. The same can happen to you when you come before the Lord. If you have a true encounter with him, his holiness will shed light on your sinfulness. When you become aware of your sinfulness and you acknowledge your sin, you say, God, forgive me. Not an angel, but Christ came down and died on the cross for our sins to purify and to take away the sins of of our lives and takes them all away. And now the end result, now that you're purified, now that you're made right before God, the only result and response from us should be, here I am, Lord. Use me and the rest of your life is given to serve that awesome God who loved us and gave his son for us. That holy encounter that Isaiah had, you can have as well. And you will be changed forever with an awesome encounter with God. Today, that day can be for you. The Bible says that God is holy. The Bible says that God is perfect, is sinless. The Bible says that we are sinners. That's a problem. The Bible says that God will judge all sin. That is fearful. Knowing that God is all holy and perfect and that we're sinners and that God is going to judge all sinful, that all sin, that is fearful. But the worst thing you can do is run from God. If you run to God, you'll find mercy and forgiveness. And you'll be his child. And he'll forgive you of your sins and give you everlasting life. Yes, God is holy. Yes, that highlights our sin. Yes, he's going to judge sin. Yes, that's fearful. But the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. 1 John chapter 4, 18 says that there is no fear in love. But catch this, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I'm going to explain that in two seconds real quick. It says that there's no fear in love. Fear of God's wrath and justice, right? Because it says perfect love drives out fear. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment. If we acknowledge our sins, we realize we deserve a terrible punishment, right? But then it says, but perfect love drives out fear. What's perfect love? What's the most perfect love there is? Jesus Christ on the cross. His perfect love that washed away our sins drives out fear because if you have no sins, there is no punishment. So why be afraid? His perfect love, Jesus' death on the cross, cast out the fear of death and hell. We can change this and just say, Jesus, What he did on the cross drives out the fear. Don't run from God. Run to God and receive his forgiveness today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, so much for your word. God, I pray if there's anyone here who has never trusted you as your Savior, anyone here, God, whose sins are aware, God, we are all sinners. I am a sinner, God. God, I pray if there's anyone here who has never trusted you as their Savior, God, I pray that today, right now, will be their moment where they surrender to you have a true encounter with you, God.
who have their sins forgiven and eternal life. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If today you have become aware and you acknowledge your sin and you believe that Jesus came down and died on the cross to pay for your sins, and on the third day you believe that he resurrected, that he conquered sin, he conquered death, and assured everlasting life, Bible says if you believe these things, if you call upon the name of the Lord, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that you will be saved. I'm not saying it, the Bible says it. So today I invite you to be saved, to be forgiven. Draw near to the Lord, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's in James. I invite you to trust Jesus as your Savior right now for the forgiveness of all of your sins and for eternal life in heaven. If there's anyone here who would like to trust Jesus as their Savior for the forgiveness of all their sins and for eternal life in heaven, raise up your hand right now. I just want to pray for you. That's all I want to do. Is there anybody? Just raise up your hand if you would like to trust Jesus as your Savior. God bless you. I see your hand. Anybody else would like to, you know, be part of this? Anybody else would like to trust Jesus as their Savior for the forgiveness of all your sins and for eternal life in heaven? Never again will you fear death. Never again will you fear, you know, the judgment of God because now you're part of His family. Don't run from God. Run to God and His perfect love will cast out the fear of judgment. Anybody else? Just raise up your hand. I'm just going to pray for you. Anybody else? Just raise up your hand. So if, if you raise up your hand or if you're sitting here and you didn't raise up your hand, you would like to trust Jesus as your Savior, pray this prayer. If you're watching online, you would like to trust Jesus, pray this prayer. If you're in the overflow, pray this prayer after me. Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I am a sinner and I don't deserve heaven. But I believe that Jesus lived and that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and on the third day I believe that he resurrected that he conquered sin and he conquered death save me Jesus I call upon your name I believe in you I confess that you are Lord And I believe that you are resurrected. Give me your Holy Spirit and help me live a brand new life starting today. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Church, let's give glory to our God. We love you guys. Congratulations to those who made the best decision. Love you guys. Good afternoon, Elevate Church. this is working. Good afternoon, Elevate Church. Uh, hey, welcome to church. As our ushers begin the collection process, we have a special Sunday today. It is Baptism Sunday, so Alex and Maya are getting baptized. Alex and Maya, if you're here or you're in overflow, go change now. Now is the time that you get out of here and go change. If you're watching, if you're overflow, make sure that you go and change it to your baptism uh, clothes. We're excited. We're going to wait outside for you. So church, if you're watching for the first time or you're here for the very first time, stay connected with us. The very easiest way to do that is by sending us a text message. Our number is 94000, 94000. And all you have to do is send us the word Go Elevate. When you do that, you're going to get a response back and you can make your very first selection there. Tell us if you're a first time guest. Maybe you want to take the next step in your faith by getting baptized. Maybe you want to start the journey. What is the journey? Glad you asked. The journey is our welcome class to Elevate Church. And guess what? It is next Sunday. So if you want to register for this 20, 25-minute class, do so today by texting the word Go Elevate to 94000 and make sure you select Journey, which is option number two. Now, the class will be held via Zoom, so we'll be in contact with you. We'll get you all the information that you need, and we will set you up. Now, believe it or not, Easter is around the corner. Yes. And as you can see, we are prepping, right? Like we're like bringing down the stage. Things are already starting to change here. But one thing is not going to change is that we need Easter eggs. But here's the thing. If you could do us a favor, as you start collecting Easter egg with a little bit of candy inside, please, if you love Jesus, put a little piece of tape so they don't split open, you know. And if you want to bring them in a bag, man, God will bless you. 
two times. Like it's going to go above and beyond. And then if you really want like the fast path to heaven, put how many eggs are in the bag. And then we are going to love you. We will give you VIP parking. You name it, you got it at Elevate Church. So start bringing those in. We might not have a traditional Easter egg hunt for the kids, but the kids will definitely have lots of Easter eggs. So please help us out with that. Cool? Cool. Elevate Church on our feet. Let's get ready for baptism. Let's wrap up this service. And thank you guys so much. And if you're watching, hey, we are so glad that you're online, but we'd rather have you here. So make your reservation for next Sunday. We, love, we want to see your face here. So thank you guys for joining. Let's pray. God, thank you, Lord, so much for who you are. And God, we are just so excited about the awesome Sunday that it is today. We've gotten to see people take their faith public through baptisms. Thank you for each and every one of those lives. Lord, thank you for the tithes and offerings that we've collected here and online. Thank you for the folks and the families watching online. And Lord, thank you for the time of worship, and thank you, Father, for your word. I know today's message, sometimes it kind of hurts, it kind of bugs us, God, but honestly, that's what we need. We need to be reminded that we are not called to be Christian atheists, we are called to be Christians, Father, 100% devoted to you. So God, thank you for who you are, we love you, and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray, amen. God bless you, church. This now concludes our service. Everybody wait outside, and we'll catch you next week.